So, if you had to sum up the philosophy you have for life on a bumper sticker, what would it say? All you need is love, forgive everyone, um, back off, could work. I love the television producer Norman Lear's answer to that question. Uh, here's a picture of Norman. He's uh, about to turn 100 years old. And he said if he had to have one bumper sticker, it would say, just another version of you. Isn't that good? Just another version of you. See, on this road called life, just like you, I have a destination I'm trying to get to. Just like you, I have people I love and want to protect and care about. Just like you, I have grandiose ideas of self-importance. And just like you, I am your partner, your neighbor, on the road of this thing called life. You know, Joseph Campbell said that the second law of life is survival. The first law of life is that we are one. See, when we learn the second rule, bypassing the first, we create separation. We create discord. We can even create chaos around us and within ourselves. Sound familiar? But when we remember that we are one, we can pivot back to this knowledge of our unity and begin to live like it, to experience greater harmony and greater oneness in this thing called life. See, for the survivalists on the road of life, everyone is in my way. Getting where I want to go is most important, even if it's at the expense of where you want to go. From the perspective of oneness, everyone on the road of life has a right to be there. We're all trying to get to our own destinations in different places. For the survivalists, there's too many damn cars on the road. You're stuck in the trap that George Carlin talked about. Of, How come everyone driving slower than you is an idiot and everyone driving faster is a maniac? There's too many Hyundais on the road. Get rid of the Hyundais. No more Pintos. For, from the perspective of oneness, yes, there's a lot of cars on the road. There's a lot of traffic out there. And from oneness perspective, we don't like traffic either, but we realize that traffic isn't just the result of so many people on the road of life. It's a lack of cooperation. It's too much braking. It's too much cutting people off. It's too much speeding. If we could only learn to trust in the creator, if we could only learn to trust in the divine, perhaps all that traffic, all that mesh, would begin to dissipate, and we could all cooperate in supporting one another on our life's journey. It reminds me of something that the master teacher Jesus said, so profound yet so simple. He said, which one of you, through worry, can add an hour to their life? See, that's what we do when we're only in that survivalist mode. We just worry. We get anxious. We create conflict thinking it will lead to solution, but it doesn't. We have to remember our oneness. We have to remember to be like the birds that Jesus pointed out, who don't worry where their next meal is going to come from because they trust in that divinity. It's easier said than done. But that's what I want to share about today, how we can pivot from just being survivalists to living in a space of oneness for ourselves and for others. And the first thing I think we need to do to do this is we have to remove any hate from around our hearts. To remove any hate from around our hearts. We have to stop hating people. And I, I may even hear that, and I, I might get defensive. I don't hate anybody. But when I explore it, I, I can see that there are might be people in my personal life who've done me wrong, who I'm still holding resentment towards. It's time to let them go, to practice discernment, but to let them move on. 
I can get caught up in hating public figures, a politician, or even as a Denver Broncos fan, folks, Tom Brady. We gotta, he's in a new conference now. We've got to let him go. I love you, Tom. We wish you well. It, you know, and it sounds contrite, but even that smallest little bit of hate, yes, it creates a great sense of competition, but it doesn't serve the person we're hating. It doesn't get them to stop behaving how we may think they're behaving in a wrong way. It doesn't help the people trying to help them, and it damn sure doesn't help us in any way. If anyone ever had a reason to hate, it may have been Coco Kondo. Coco was just eight months old, 75 years ago, when the first atomic bomb was dropped on the country of Japan in an attempt to end World War II. First in Hiroshima and then in Nagasaki. As a young girl, she had to interact with children who were orphaned because of the bomb. She had to interact with the mental and emotional and incredible physical scarring of so many people in her community, and she vowed to get revenge. She vowed to hate every American. And a decade later, through an odd chance event, her father, who was a minister, was asked to come to America, and he brought little 10-year-old Kondo with him to be on the show from the 1950s, This Is Your Life. And there, her father shared about his experience of living through the bomb and seeing all the terrible effects that it had. And just then, uh, just afterwards, a gentleman by the name of Robert Lewis, Captain Robert Lewis, stage. Lewis had been the co-pilot of the Enola Gay that had dropped the bomb. And she said, I sat in my chair and I seized at this man. But then he began to talk. And he began to share how challenging that day was, and he began to weep as he shared after the bomb was dropped that he wrote in his log, my God, what have we done? And she shares that at that very moment, all of the hate around her heart began to dissipate. She realized that she could still hate war and the problems in humanity that lead to it, but she could not hate this man. She approached Lewis, and she shared, I just wanted to touch his hand because I thought, that's my way of showing I'm sorry I hated you. But it's not you who I should hate. And he felt my hand touch his hand, and he held my hand very tight. What a courageous act from a 10-year-old girl who would go on to dedicate her life to the dismantling of nuclear weapons, and still to this day, every year on the anniversary of the bomb, she goes to the memorial and she says a prayer for Captain Lewis to rest in peace. I say this idea of removing the hate around our hearts because I don't believe there's room in any of our hearts for hate. It's a law of the heart that I invite you to consider today, the idea that you can't open your heart to one and leave it closed to another. You can't open your heart to one and leave it closed to another. Either you are in the reciprocity of love and the givingness of love and the receiving of love in your your life, or you're clogged up because you've allowed that hate to be around your heart. Doesn't mean that you have to be in relationship or coddle everyone. It just means there's that willingness that if someone isn't gonna be loved by you, that you're at least willing to have God love them for someone else to love them. Our founder says, if you want to stay out of hell, then no one can ever be in it. He's talking about that hell of everyday life when we spend too much time in judgment and in critique of others. A second thing that I think we're called to do to move from just a survivalist perspective to one of oneness and unity is we have to have a vision for unity. Have a vision for unity in your life. It's one of the upsetting things about American politics and perhaps politics in general for me that so often now you don't hear so much someone's vision 
for the country, but you hear the apocalyptic vision of what will happen if you vote for a candidate other than themselves. And this is perhaps good politics, but it's not good unity. And so it may be each of you, each of us, that's called to say, what is my vision for my life? What is my vision for my family? What is my vision for my community? And what is my vision for my country? And to hold that vision and see even the deepest seated hate, even the greatest amount of pessimism can be transformed into a catapult to achieving that vision of oneness and unity in our lives. Unity and oneness isn't just soft goobly gook. It's the stuff of change. It's the stuff of empowerment. It's the stuff of healing. I was talking a little earlier about Norman Lear, who, as I said, was a successful television producer. And he shared his first experience of hate being in the 1930s as a young boy, listening to the radio from a Catholic teacher from Detroit by the name of of Father Coughlin. Father Coughlin had, at his height, 30 million people a week turning into his program. And under the guise of social justice, uh, Father Coughlin would rail against Roosevelt and his administration at the time. He would uh, rail against any involvement in the growing European conflict that led to World War II. And he had a tendency to blame um, Jewish people for everything that was wrong in the country. Ultimately, he would side with fascism and he'd be a, a sympathizer of Hitler. And he would even say on the radio, when we get through with the Jews in America, they'll think the treatment they received in Germany was nothing. Norman Lear, hearing that, he said, Coughlin repulsed me thoroughly, but I listened to him enough and was so chilled by his polarizing and divisive rhetoric as to be reminded of him throughout my life whenever I've run into an irrational, self-serving mix of politics and religion. This was my introduction to the fact that there were people who disliked, mistrusted, even hated me because I was born a Jew. If I didn't have a nose for the slightest whiff of anti-Semitism before, I had it from that moment on. So experiencing this hate, Lear also got a calling. The calling for him was comedy. He had another line in his life that he's always used, when we laugh, we are one. And probably the, the pinnacle of his creativity was a TV show called All in the Family. It began in the 1970s, and it was about a man named Archie Bunker, played by the brilliant Carol O'Connell. And he was an interesting figure because, you see, he was, uh, he was a, a racist, but he had this caring heart. He was homophobic, but he had this caring for people around him. He was a misogynist, but he was a good dad and a good wife. And so every week, you both pity and get angry at this character, yet you have compassion for him. You see how he has even been a victim of the race thought, carrying these thoughts, and each week he weakens a little bit more to all of our amusement and laughing. And each of us get to see how we may sometimes, unfortunately, persist in a system that may discriminate against others. So Lear took a message of hate and was inspired to create a message of unity. Bunker was based on his own father who used to call him Meathead. So there's something powerful that all of us can do when we hold a higher vision of oneness for ourselves and our lives. I love how Ruth Bader Ginsburg once put it. She said, fight for the things you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. Ginsburg was famously, it's been well documented, best friends on the Supreme Court with Antonin Scalia, uh, two individuals who had very different interpretations of the law, but got along like best friends behind the scenes. After his death, she shared of their relationship, we are different, but we are one. Different in our interpretation of written text, one in our reverence for the Constitution and the institution we serve. A great reminder that we can disagree but not question each other's hearts. Because here's another law of the heart. The heart lives in possibility. Our minds slip into pessimism. 
our minds slip into doubt, our hearts thrive in possibility and continue to always have available for us a vision that we can translate and transfer into our lives. A third thing that each of us can do to move from survivalists to oneness is to daily remember what is ours to do. What is mine to do in the work to dismantle any framework of judgment and separation within myself and to contribute to greater oneness with all of those around me? It's the hard work, but it's the most important work of our lives. You know, our founder, Ernest Holmes, he, he talks about us being one, but he talks a lot about the one mind. And he says something I think kind of profound, if not incredibly challenging. He says, everything you have ever thought, said, done, seen, learned, or experienced has left an imprint on your subconscious mind. That's kind of easy. But this subconscious also contains memory images of your family life, your ancestral background, and the sum total of what the whole world has thought or believed. Now that's a lot. Wait a second, so I have my own individual mind, yet there's also this aspect of my mind that is connected with every mind that's ever been before, and I've inherited to some degree all the thoughts of my parents and their parents and their parents and the whole human race. That's a lot of thoughts. And so our spiritual calling is to develop our own individual mind, but to realize we're not as separated from others as we think that all of the thoughts are of the ages, all the beautiful, brilliant ones, but also all of the terrible, discriminatory ones are all there. It's all around us. And it can only take one moment of unconsciousness to slip back into an old way of thinking that would say that we're not one or that would say that we are separate. And each of us as a human being in honor of our ancestors have that ability to allow our own conscious thoughts to bring forth greater unity and oneness and love for our fellow human beings. Isabel Wilkerson is a acclaimed writer. Um, she's written a, a new book that I predict will win all the, the book awards called Cast, and it is about, um, through uh, the beginnings of slavery in our, our country, we created this caste system that as much as we've been trying to undo over our history, people have been trying to keep in place in all sorts of different ways. And uh, it's, a, it's a very challenging and strong book, but she tells a, a brief story in there about uh, being a reporter for the New York Times and going to interview a, a businessman. And she comes into the office and, and she says, is this businessman available? And he's right there. And he looks at her and says... Uh, no, I'm not available. There's a very important reporter from the New York Times that are, that's about to come in and interview me. She's caught by that. And she says, no, no, I'm that reporter from the New York Times. And he's caught, you see. And so he, he begins to demand uh, uh, some identification. Who are you that says who you are, that, that you're from the New York Times? Well, I've given my card, sir, to everyone today. I've been, been working all day. I'm here to interview on this very important topic. And they argue and haggle, and eventually she has to leave, and he doesn't get interviewed. The article that she writes winds up being on the front page of the newspaper. And here, this man has made an incredible mistake because of his own judgments about gender or about race, that ultimately kept him from getting on the front page of the New York Times. And she shares in a quite powerful way that she's never shared this man's name or the company. She did send him his, uh, her business card at one point because she thought calling him out wasn't going to change anything for her. But she shares her story for all of us to both sympathize with what she's been through and perhaps some of us can even sympathize to a degree with the mistake that this individual made and catch ourselves from making the same mistake. Think about that for a moment. Can you remember a time where you were held in someone's vision that didn't see the truth of who you are? That didn't behold you as just another version of themselves? How did that make you feel? And perhaps this takes a little courage. You can remember a time when you beheld someone and didn't see the truth of who they were and judge them for how they look or how they may have behaved in one instance. And out of that, if we can go deep 
we can bring forth a vision of the divine that holds each and every one of us as precious, that holds each and every one of us as an expression of the Most High, that holds and uplifts everyone in our hearts. And that's another law of the heart, that our heart doesn't see as we see, it sees as God sees. We have our eyes and our minds to see the world, however we want to categorize it, but our hearts know our oneness. And we're willing to see with the eyes of the heart, we begin to embrace a vision of unity all around us. Ernest Holmes goes on. He gives us some answers for how to bring this vision of the divine into our own mind. He says, these memories are not dead things, quite the reverse. They are always active. But there is more to it than this. Just as you are being acted upon by your own memories, the mind of history and your environment, you are also being acted upon by the mind of God, which is with and around you. But you are a creator and not a creature. Today, you may be suffering from the effects of the race consciousness and your own beliefs, but today, you can begin to change them. Say, I know that I am one with God. I know that God in me is perfect. I know that my real nature is spiritual. I know that I exist in a boundless good, in a heavenly state, and in perfect being. I know that my mind is being acted upon by pure spirit. Divine intelligence guides me into peace, happiness, and success, into joy, love, and perfect life. One final law of the heart as we move into prayer today. What the heart wants It does not just want for one, but for all. What the heart wants, it does not just want for one, but for all. This to me is a secret of prayer. That when I can ask God for something for myself that I would not restrict from anybody else, then I have found more often than not that my prayer can be answered. When I'm willing to pray not only for my highest good, but for the highest good of all, then I have truly stepped into the answer of my prayer.